All right. Um, when I was about 13 years old, I had this rifle and I took it apart. I was curious about it, so I took it apart. I wanted to understand how the mechanics of it worked and uh, took it all apart, laid it out on the kitchen table, and, uh, and then I put it back together. And there were three parts that were left over from the gun. And it didn't work right as a result of those three parts not being where they were supposed to be. And, but I didn't know where they fit. I couldn't figure out where they belonged. And, and so I ruined the gun. Um, well, I, I tell you that because I think the Christian life has some parts to it that are absolutely essential to experiencing the, what, the Christian life the way it's supposed to be. And I want to talk to you about one of them this morning because you may have been lied to in a way you may have gotten the impression that your faith is a very personal thing, an individual experience, and that, you know, that really it's all just about you. But that is not, when you, when you read the Bible, that is not what you get from the text uh, of Scripture. The Scripture shows that we need each other. We need others and they need us. And that is the way the Christian life is described in the New Testament, the body of Christ, each having its part. In fact, one of the great verses of the Bible in the New Testament is Acts chapter 2, and it starts this way. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So right off, what you see is this devotion in the early church among the people of God. And they were devoted to coming and receiving the teaching and being a part of the teaching, uh, uh, practicing the teaching. Uh, they were devoted to the fellowship of the church, uh, the, the idea of the church and the practical application of the church. They were devoted to this thing that Jesus had started and that he had given them over to to take responsibility over and to the breaking of bread that is they communed with one another they they had meals with one another and and to prayers they were devoted to gathering together in prayer and when they were devoted like this in prayer awe came upon them came over their souls a sense of reverence a sense of holiness an experience if you will of the divine the holy the presence of god came upon them it was preceded with a devotion to the word of god and then as a result of this devotion and commitment to each other and to the lord uh, god revealed himself in ways in such that there was wonders among them signs among them that is god was at work and they began to experience god in all kinds of ways in verse 44, it says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And so there was a togetherness in the early church that is so desperately needed. And in fact, without that togetherness, you will not get the same result. There, there must be togetherness. And that common connection with one another that time together that time spent together that deference to one another that um that commitment to one another produces something Look, notice what it says it says all who believed uh, they had things in common they knew each other in verse 45 it says and they uh, sold things that they had and distributed to the needs so first there was a devotion to the fellowship and to the word of god that produced the workings of God in them. And second, there was a commitment to one another that God used to meet needs and provide. And then verse 46, and day by day, daily, they were worshiping together. They were breaking bread in their homes and they received their food with gladness and generous hearts. And so this, the third thing you see in the text, you see a devotion, you see a togetherness, and then you see in this text here, they, they, were, um, they, they were humble and they were together. And as a result of their togetherness, they opened up their homes. They opened up their hearts. 
they open up their mouths and they begin to share their stories and share their life with one another. In order for a church to be functioning correctly, we have to know one another. We, know, we have to know when each other's grieving, when, to, when each other's rejoicing. So the Bible says to rejoice with those that rejoice and grieve with those that grieve. How can we grieve with one another if we don't know one another? And I really believe this, that God is ever present in times of trouble. And if we're going to be godly, we have to show up when there's trouble. We have to be the people of God that roll up our sleeves and not run away from the mess and the problem, but run right into it with the grace of God. And what happens as a result, if you want to reverse engineer this situation, look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the number day by day those that were being saved or being saved. So what you see is in this early church, just every day God was adding to the church. Every day God was on the move changing lives, impacting people. I like to think about it like going up on front of the stove when I was a kid and we'd put the popcorn in the pan and we'd wait and the heat would come and then all of a sudden just start popping everywhere. And that's what's happening here in the early church. The Holy Spirit's just heating everything up and there's just things happening all around them. It's what C.S. Lewis said that the earth is crowded with God. And that's what it feels like when you're in that kind of moment where you just see God at work everywhere. It's really quite amazing amazing to me how that one person can be looking at the exact situation and they just see God all in it. And another person can be looking at the situation and can't see God anywhere. And this is why Jesus would say when he started teaching, those of you that have eyes to see, see. And those of you that have ears to hear, hear. And I'm praying for you this morning that you'll hear from the Lord and that you'll get a vision of God at work like this early church. But there's a thing here that you need to do. You need to reverse engineer this. You need to say, okay, if I want to see this, if I want to experience the awe and the wonder of the presence of God and the practical needs of people being met, and I want to see people saved on a regular basis, their lives changed, then what are the parts of this text that I need to apps essentials that I need to have in my life first a devoted they were devoted people to the word of God in the fellowship second they were humble enough to get to know one another and care about one another and then third they were together and I just want to encourage you this way they opened up their hearts and their homes and their mouths and they were together. This is my table I bought Julie 30 years ago. Man, I've got a jacket older than some of y'all. And this table here is our first table we bought as a couple in Porsche at the antique store over there, right on the other side of Black Rock. And we bought it and we, we loved it and we had the tables and the, the table and the chairs and This table was where it kind of all began in a lot of ways. Um, At this table, our first interns came over to the house and ate. And we schemed and dreamed about what God was going to do that summer. At this table, my friend James, who went to Africa to be a missionary, before he ever went, he sat at this table and we prayed that God might do something great. My friend Chase Reynolds, who became a a Bible translator for Wycliffe, he came and we sat around this table and had dinner and he shared what God was doing on his life. My friend Joey Cook, who grew up over here in Locust Grove, it was at this table he shared his heart to plant a church. And I just think about over the years, we had missional community around this table small groups around this table after church on Sunday people my teenage boys when they were they were at that age where they were teenagers all their friends would come around this table and we would just you know at 10 o'clock at night I'd say you boys want to go get some baconators and they're like what and we'd go get baconators 10 o'clock at night and we'd sit around the table with those boys and and there's just this community when I think about this table I I think about my life in fact we were doing this with the interns the other day I had this little object lesson where we took a piece of wire and I just laid out my story in images, and I'm helping them learn how to share their story. My first one is a bed with a pillow. I've said it many times that when I was a little boy, my mom taught me a prayer. When 
when I was just a little boy. And I don't know that she understood the gravity and the magnitude of that prayer, but she taught a little boy that the God of the universe hears him when he lays his head down at night on the pillow and talks to him. And that little boy believed it. And I'm telling you, it was a seismic shift that happened in my life in that moment. And then that next one is a little tombstone, a little cross stone. It's when my daddy died when I was 10. The Bible says that God becomes a father to the fatherless. And I felt that during that season, that God was watching over me. In fact, he put it on the heart of a church to have a little bus and come by and pick up kids. And they picked me up on the church bus and brought me to church. And I began to learn about the Lord. And then when I was in 11th grade, my pastor invited me to his table. And we sat at the table. And I remember him saying to me, Chad, as long as I have food, you've got a place to eat. As long as I have a car, you have a way to go. And as long as I have a home, you have a place to stay. And he spiritually adopted me. And he poured into my life. And then I had a key I put on there, a little key. And that key is the key to my dorm room. Because I got it and I lived in Twin Towers at ASU. And I got this key on the ninth floor. And I walked up there and I put my key in my dorm room. And I remembered the verse, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And I remember turning the key to the dorm room and thinking, as for me and my dorm room, we're going to serve the Lord. And then I have this little family that I drew out. Now, the difference between here and here is not me. This is not a Chad story. This is a Jesus story. This is a story of his goodness and his grace. I want to encourage you this way. Tell your story. And then I want to encourage you to get a table and invite people to it. Invite people to your table. Open up your life. The Christian life, the absolute building block of the New Testament church is life together. That's it. That's where it all begins. That life together as God's working in you and inviting people into the life. Now, I, I know that there's kind of this, well, w- one of these days, I call it the wind syndrome. Well, when I get out of high school, then, then I'll start living this way. Why not do it in high school? You say, well, when I, when I finally get a better place, when I get a better place, right now I'm living in a kind of a rough spot and it's hard to invite anybody over. And why don't you just go ahead and invite somebody to the worst place you've ever lived and say, come on. What about this? Uh, well, once the pregnancy o- is over, <laughs> then, uh, then we'll start doing this. We'll start living life on mission. Why, why not just go ahead and do it while you're pregnant? When we get the kids out of diapers, when we get them out of t-ball, when we get them into kindergarten, when we get them through this tough stage, when our life's less busy, when we get them through their teenage years. I can't really have anybody at my table right now because I'm on a diet. (laughs) It'll mess up my diet. When I feel better, I just feel crummy, and I don't, when we have more money, if you're not careful, you will keep doing that until your life is over and never get to the business of being on mission for God. The New Testament says, offer hospitality to one another and without grumbling. Why does it say that? (laughs) Because we have a tendency to grumble, right? The word hospitality in the Greek is to love the stranger. It is the absolute opposite of xenophobia. It It is to love the stranger instead of to fear them. It is to embrace the newcomer 
and to, to welcome them to the gospel, to welcome them into your life. Jesus, whenever he was with Zacchaeus, he was coming down the road, and you remember the song maybe if you grew up in church or had been to Bible school, and uh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he? And he climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I messed that up, I think. Um, and then Jesus comes along, and he wags his hand at him. If you're the teacher, right, singing the song, Zacchaeus, you come down. No, that's not the right way to sing it. All you teachers at our church, I don't want you to wag your finger at them. I want you to do this. Zacchaeus, get in here. I think that's the spirit of the song or the spirit of the text. Because he says here in Mark chapter 2, he says, Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake and a large crowd came and he began to teach. And um, you saw Levi and he was eating with uh, the tax collector. He says, follow me. And when Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many of the tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and many followed him. And the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the uber-religious, they wagged their heads and wagged their fingers. Jesus is eating with sinners. Isn't that good news? (laughs) That Jesus invites somebody like me to the table and somebody like you. I'm telling you, that kind of shocks my sensibility a little bit because I remember there was a time growing up that I come from a a fairly rough circumstance with some rough things. And there was a kid at school whose mom really didn't want her son hanging out with me. And, you know, as I thought about it, even at that age, I thought, I don't really blame her. And then a few years later, the Lord had changed my life and really done all kinds of things in our lives. And and my boys were in school, and they wanted to bring home rough kids. And I'm telling the truth, I didn't really want them at my table. And the Lord had to really work my heart over. We can price ourselves out of being in ministry and being used of God. We can begin to treat people and things and stuff and work as if it's beneath us. We can have a huge education in theology and a little bit of compassion. This is what Rosaria Butterfield says. She says, those who live out radical, ordinary hospitality see their homes not as theirs at all but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors. They seek out people. They know that the gospel comes with a house key. Knowing your personality does not excuse you from ministry. Man, does this generation need to hear that. Well, I'm an introvert. Oh, okay. La-di-da. You still are called to the commission of Christ. That was, a, that was harsh, sorry. <laughs> it means that you need to prepare differently if you're going to be in ministry. It doesn't mean that you get an out to be in ministry. Let God use your home, let God use your apartment, let God use your dorm room, your front yard your community gymnasium, your garden, for his purposes, making strangers, neighbors, and neighbors family. Because that is the point, building the church and living like a family, the family of God. Radical, ordinary, daily hospitality is the basic building block of a vital Christian life. Man. I think about that book that I read in a counseling class by Kohler, he says that one of the guiding assumptions of our life should be that God's already at work. And we're just joining him in his work. Somebody at work or somebody down the neighborhood or wherever, somebody in your family or somebody wherever, and you just look at him and you think, oh, Lord, please don't make me deal with that person. They're the farthest from God. God's already at work in their lives. 
And sometimes complex problems don't need complex solutions. Sometimes dinner can fix a lot of stuff. Sometimes a walk can work things out. We're living in a time right now where it's difficult to know just how direct to be in our generation. Um, because American Western culture, we, we bristle at the idea of anybody telling us anything. Right? We, we, we don't like to be directed. We like to come up with it on our own. And it's hard sometimes to know exactly the tone to take. But did you know right now in America of church-going people, church-going people go to church 1.7 times a month, less than two times a month. That's taking the bite, the teeth out of the power of the local church. That lack of togetherness and that lack of unity and that lack of devotion is robbing the church of power because they're not, they're not devoted to the teaching like they should be and they're not devoted to the fellowship like they should be and as a result, they're not knowing each other in a way in which God can work and we're seeing a great decline. It makes me think of that quote, I'll have a, a cup of God, please. Not too much. Not enough to explode my heart with passion. Just a little. Another thing about gathering as a people of God is what Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together calls the wish dream. Listen to what he says. The person who loves their dream of community or their wish dream will destroy the community. And I want to caution you as a church. Because what can happen is when you get excited about a church, you can begin to have these expectations on everybody around you, and those expectations can choke out the actual church. Christian community is like Christian sanctification. It is a gift of God which we cannot claim. Only God knows the real state of our fellowship and our sanctification. What may appear weak and trifling to us may be great and glorious to God. I'll just put that in a practical way. I was thinking about Tyler and Leah. Tyler and Leah on Wednesday night have a bunch of teenagers at their house. And, they've, you know, have you seen Ty Leah with the kids and Tyler? I mean, if you ever watch Jim Gaffigan and him joking about kids, you, I mean, that's what you think about with Leah and Tyler. I mean, just got kids everywhere. And it's crazy sometimes. And, uh, you know, Tyler will call me and say, uh, Chad, uh, we were crying this morning. <laughs> you know, I guess it's rough over here. And he, it's just, a, it, they're in a season that's messy. They're in a season that's hard. And, but here's what's amazing. You talk to our teenagers. Go ahead and ask them what's going on on Wednesday nights in that house. God is showing up in that house. Amen? God is showing up in that place. And sometimes they're frazzled and sometimes they're worn out and sometimes they're overwhelmed and sometimes they think, man, we blew it tonight and it's awful. And it's, it's like he said, it's trifle, it's weak. And yet what Bonhoeffer says here is what we might think is trifle and weak, God may see as great and glorious. I love it. Just as the Christian should not be constantly feeling his pulse, right? Am I okay? Am I okay? Am I okay? Am I okay? The Christian can let off of that compulsion and say, in Christ, the work is settled. I am okay, right? It's finished. And I'm going to be all right. One way or another, the Lord is going to see it through. He who began a work is going to complete it. I don't have to constantly be checking my pulse. He said the same thing is true in the Christian community. For that person that's constantly assessing, 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 criticizing, 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 is a moment which that is ruining your experience. My pastor used to say, we don't get what, we, what ought to be, we get what is. 
And that's what they say in counseling too, right? That we, we learn to love who we have. I like what Steve Sojourn said in his little book. He said, I dream of a simple church marked by a simple proposition that we are otherly. That we are otherly. That we care about others. Like the Philippian writer says, we count others more than ourselves. The proverb from the African proverb says that if you want to go fast, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, you got to go together. And I, I want to encourage you. We've been in a series called Living uh, or What Matters Most. Living like eternity matters. Living like the word of God matters. Like the gospel matters. I want to encourage you to live like together matters. And some warnings to consider. First, the, the issue of evangelism. Evangelism, we're, everybody is an evangelist for something. Right? We all, we all have this in us, this compulsion to say, hey, good news, there's a sale going on at Bella Bird. <laughs> right? Or, hey, good news, I lost five pounds. Or, good news, investments are up. <laughs> good news, whatever it is. I mean, we all have it in us, right? There's a compulsion for our lives in every one of us, whether we know it or not, are an evangelist for something. We leverage and we communicate what is the good news of our life. And I just want to appeal to you, Christian friend. Make Jesus the good news of your life. Make much of Jesus with your life. May the people that you work with and the people that are your neighbors and the people that you're friends with and the people that you interact with, may they see and hear about Jesus from your life. Because we're all evangelists for something. And when it's all said and done, and this time is over, we best be about the Father's business. I like this verse, and we were praying this uh, Wednesday night in Acts chapter 6. The word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied, and a great many became obedient to the faith. That's, what a verse. Their lives were being devoted to the things of God. And as a result, the word of God increased. And it just spread. It was, they preached the word with boldness. People received the word of God. They grew in their faith. They grew in the knowledge and the, the grace of God. And they, there was just great joy in Acts 8, it says, in verse 8, there was great joy in the city. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. That's just the verse. There was great joy in the city. Why? Why was there such joy? Because the word of God had penetrated the darknesses of, of their lives. And a great number of disciples were multiplied. So whatever it was, there was a spirit of, it was contagious and it was joyful and it was spreading like crazy, the gospel in this Christian life. So much so that people begin to be obedient to the faith. I believe this scripture is normative, not just narrative. And what I mean by that is sometimes you read something and you think, well, that's what went on then. But there's things that you read in the Bible that it's not just things that went on then. It's supposed to be going on now. And Acts chapter 2 is supposed to be happening here in this place. It's supposed to be the normative, prescriptive practice of our church. And the fundamental 
thing that I'm speaking to you about today is togetherness. God wants to do something with your house, with your job, with your stuff, with your personality, with your family, with your high school years, with your single life, with your child rearing years, with your empty nest, even with your setbacks and your troubles. God wants to use whatever you have for his mission. And the church that turned the world upside down had dinner together, <laughs> right? They, they preferred life together. And so when they had a t-ball game down here at Southside, they said, hey, let's go out and have dinner afterwards. That's the way they behaved. They spent time together. And that's, I just want to cast a little vision as a pastor. That's the kind of church I, I want to be a part of. There's no power in a church that just clocks in on Sunday morning. See you next week for an hour. You won't keep a pastor acting that way. That won't even keep your kids. A lackadaisical, moderate faith will not inspire a next generation. You want your kids to be hot-hearted for the Lord. You be hot-hearted for the Lord. You want your kids to put a priority on the things of God. You recalibrate your life and put a priority on the things of God. I have a friend of mine who pastored for 25 years, and on his 25th anniversary, he said something happened. I talked to him about, I don't know, about four years later, somewhere, some, two or three, four years later, and he, he had quit pastoring. And I'm always curious about this because I want to last. If the Lord will let me, and I can keep my mind, I'd like to preach till the end. <laughs> right? I, I want to last. And I know what it's like to be discouraged and give up. And so I'm always asking pastors about their tenure. I like to, like, like I said, reverse engineer, and I also like to do autopsies. Like on a ministry that crashed and burned, I'm very interested in a very morbid way. Yes, I want to know. And so I asked him, I was like, hey, how did, what happened? You were pastoring and doing so good for 25 years. What happened? He said, well, uh, he said, I'll tell you what got me. Entitlement killed my ministry. And I was like, do tell. Tell me what you're talking about. And he said, just a seed thought got in my head. But here's what it was. He said, I began to say to myself, I've been here 25 years. I ought to get treated better than this. I've been here 25 years. I ought to get paid better than this. I've been here 25 years. Somebody else ought to lock up. I've been here 25 years. Can you just see it? And he said it was like a cancer. That entitlement was like a cancer that just seeded into his heart and ruined his ability to be a minister. And I'm telling you, friend, that can happen in your life. You don't have to be a minister to have that happen in your Christian life. You can begin to price yourself out of being used by God. And I want to just call you back to the humility of the foot washing Savior that you follow. He's the one that stoops. He's the one that rolls up his sleeves and gets dirty. He's the one that made himself available. He's the one who, though he, it was not robber to be equal with God, yet he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. Entitlement will destroy your effectiveness for the Lord. So be faithful, not exceptional. You know, so many folks want to be exceptional. Just be faithful. Be humble, not prideful. Be supportive, not selfish. Be inclusive, not exclusive. Be innocent, not suspicious. Be available, not aloof. Be patient, not irritable. And be gracious, not entitled. So be faithful over little things. If you're opting out, if you're showing up late, if you're leaving early, if you're, if you're behaving that way, Allow your heart to be tender today. We're in prayer times on Thursday mornings and we're in this text 
this last week. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the call of God on, that's been spoken over your life, the prophetic word. May they help you to fight the Lord's battle. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some have deliberately violated their consciences and have shipwrecked their faith. Mm. Such strong language. What's he saying there? Lay hold to the faith. Get a tight grip on it. And do not let it go. And respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. When the Lord's knocking at your heart, and when the Lord's convicting you, when God's trying to get your attention, when you know your conscience is not clear because God's Word has directly opposed it, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, don't shipwreck your faith. Don't get messed up. I want you to last. I want to hear a well done from the master when you stand before the Lord. I want you to, Paul said, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith and henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not only to me, but all those who love his appearing. And Timothy, I want you to run your race and I want you to be glad to hit the finish line. And I want the day to come for you to just love the appearing of the Lord. Not dread it. There are those in the Bible that they think of the coming of the Lord. and They say, doom, doom. They dread the idea of the return of the Lord. They want to pull the mountains down on their heads. But not you, Timothy. Don't be that way. Don't live that way. Keep your conscience clear. And get your heart right with the Lord. I just want to end the message this morning at the table. Because Jesus, when the night before he was to be crucified, he Right, The scripture says that he came to the table with his disciples and he uh, had communion with them. And this moment, he said, I want you to do this as often as you do it. I want you to do it to remember me. And uh, when you do it, I want you to examine your heart. And I want this to be a regular occurrence in your life of examining your heart and remembering the extravagant grace that has brought you to the table, right? And because when we remember the extravagant grace that brings us to the table, then we will be the kind of people, you know this table has something? This table has one of these extenders. It's pretty cool. It's got nice little gears in there. This table comes with a leaf that you can stick inside and you can any moment pull it out of the closet, pull some more chairs up and stick it in there. You know why they do that, right? Because we're expecting more people to be added to the table. And so as I finish this message today, I just want to invite you to Christ's table. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Drink of his forgiveness. Taste of his goodness. Consume his sacrifice for you. You don't have to be hungry anymore. He that is thirsty, let him come and drink, the Bible says. And I want to just bow your head with me and offer it to you, the grace of God, if you've never received it. This will be an invitation for you and just as every head is bowed, this may have been your first time to ever come to this church, or you may have been coming the whole time, but if you don't know the Lord, I want to invite you right where you're at to receive the gospel. Jesus receives you, friend. Would you receive him? Maybe in your heart, the Lord has readied you and prepared you and your heart this morning is sensitive and you are tuned in 
by the working of the Holy Spirit right now, you are tuned in and you would say yes and amen to this. Yes and amen, Lord. I receive the grace. Forgive me of my sin, Lord. I'll take it. I'll take this cup. I'll take this salvation. The psalmist, when he said it this way, he said, What will I render unto the Lord for all the blessings he has bestowed upon me? He said, I will take up the cup of salvation and I will declare it in the congregation. And so right where you're at, friend, would you just call on the Lord and receive him?